Hi, and welcome to episode number 122 of the weekly Google Cloud Platform podcast. I'm Mark Mandel, and I'm here with my colleague, Melanie Warwick. Hi, Melanie. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, before we get started today, I know you and I wanted to just have a little personal note to talk about the recent incident at YouTube in San Bruno. We wanted to acknowledge that that happened. And just a side note on that, usually we record our interviews in our wrappers, as we like to call them, a couple days out before we launch mm. our podcast on Wednesdays. So we'd recorded last week's prior. But yeah, we wanted to acknowledge what happened and also the fact that Obviously, these are some serious issues that are going on in the U.S. as well as other locations. And we want to give our support to our YouTube colleagues and those who've been impacted. Absolutely. Um, And just as a reminder, uh, if you need any sort of mental health help, please reach out. There are plenty of resources. Uh, We'll put some in the show notes as well. And and we're also grateful for the support that the community has been showing to the YouTubers as well. There's a lot of great people. Companies. Images and things that have been shared. But yes, uh, mental health is a big issue. There's a significant amount of stigma that's still out there, but there's some great resources and support that's coming out. And we highly recommend people reach out if they need help. Okay. So Mark, this week we have actually a podcast interview that I'm excited about because we got a chance to bring in some of the folks from Project Jupiter. Yep. Jessica, UV, and Chris, who are all here to talk to us about Project Jupiter. And specifically, we dive into Jupiter Hub as well as Binder and, and just get into the mechanics and the support around that. And this is a tool or tools that are being used specifically around the research, but they're not just for researchers. So you'll hear more about that shortly. Then after that, uh, as always, we do our question of the week where we're talking about how did Google predictions do during March Madness, which I believe is basketball. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I love it. You're the gamer, <laughs> but yet neither <laughs> of us really know that much about sports outside nope. of that. Anyway, okay. So cool things of the week? Yeah. Let's start with your favorite. Okay. Yeah. So this was, this was actually a couple of weeks ago, but is is really cool. If you hadn't known, there's a new Dragon Ball Z game coming out that's hosted on Google Cloud Platform. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the video they did at the Game Developer Conference presentation they did at the Google Developer Day, where they talk about how they use Spanner for global consistency, as well as the Google network to enable player versus player action around the world. Um, they show a live demo of someone playing in San Francisco against someone in Japan, which is really, really cool, uh, with really low latency and a really great real-time gameplay. And one of the other cool things that they're using is BigQuery and to help do their analysis, which I think is great. But it's, it is. It's pretty impressive in terms of being able to use Spanner as a way to, to connect all the, the different players out there. Next cool thing of the week that we want to mention is Text-to-Speech, which is powered by DeepMind's WaveNet. So Text-to-Speech is a new API that has been developed and is out there now on Google Cloud Console that you can use to basically convert text-to-speech. And they have 32 different voices from 12 languages. The nice thing is that it's running on TPU, so it takes one second of speech and can convert it in 50 milliseconds. Um, It's got much higher fidelity, higher quality. This WaveNet model that they're using is actually something that was initially developed and provided back in 2016, but it's been significantly improved since then and and used for things like text-to-speech. So check it out. Nice. And finally, a project that I'm actually a huge fan of, uh, GitLab. If you've never used it, it's a great DevOps lifecycle tool as well as a great place to host Git for, say, uh, in-studio or in-company projects. I've used GitLab in the past, but I've never actually been exposed so much to their continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline tooling. But it just got even better in that they have a new auto DevOps feature, which uh, detects the language your app is written in and automatically builds your CI and CD pipelines for you. And particularly of note is that it can now push really nicely up to Kubernetes, either a GKE cluster or an existing Kubernetes cluster in a great way that works for continuous delivery. So it's got some great tools in it. Super happy with what GitLab's doing. Okay, Mark, I think it's time to go talk to the group from Project Jupiter. Sounds good. Let's do it. So this week, we are excited to have with us several members of the team Project Jupiter. We've got Jessica Ford, UV Panda, and Chris Holdgraf. Welcome. Yeah, it's great to be here. Hi. Hi. So um, I would like you all to take a minute and just explain a little bit more of what you do on Project Jupiter. So Jess, why don't you start? So my name is Jessica Ford. I've been with Project Jupiter for a little less than a year. And I work on a number of projects. I'm actually a cross project. So I, I've been working a lot with the Jupyter Hub team um, with uh, UV and Chris. And then I also do a lot of my work on the blog, the website. And I also work on uh, Jupyter Lab, uh, which is our new imagination of what communication can be like with Jupyter notebook-like interfaces. And so we, we just recently announced 
response to that as well. You guys can look at that. I, we're, we're probably not going to be talking as much about that, but Jupiter Lab is also another project of ours. We have we have actually a number of projects, and so I, I end up working on a lot of them. Hi, my name is uh, Yuvi. I work at UC Berkeley. Uh, as I run the technical operations for the data science division. I'm also part of Project Jupyter. I've been contributing to them for about two years. I mostly work on scalability stuff. Uh, so that's Jupyter Hub, Binder Hub. I run the big Jupyter Hubs that Berkeley uses for both their like local classes and their online classes. And I also do like operations for Binder Hub on mybinder.org. And then I also like develop a lot of the Kubernetes integrations uh, for both Jupyter Hub and like related projects like Task. Um, yeah, my name is Chris Holgraf. I'm a uh, a fellow over at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. And I've been in the sort of open source data analytic world in Python for several years now, and have sort of bumped up against the Jupyter world over that time. Now I work on the Jupyter project as a link between the technical development and some of the specific use cases and organizations that use Jupyter technology. So just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, and making sure that the things that we're building in Jupyter are matching onto needs that people have um, in the scientific and the education community. So we've all talked about what you work on. Can you talk to us a little bit about what is Project Jupiter and a little bit about its history? Where did it come from? Because I know IPython Notebooks originated as one of the main projects, but can you tell us a little more about all of this? Well, okay, I'll start. So back in, I think, Colorado, there was a physicist named Fernando Perez who was working on his PhD and he wanted to be able to share his research with his colleagues back home in Medellin, Colombia, and was frustrated by the fact that the software he was working with was very expensive and was closed source, and he couldn't necessarily share it very easily with people back home. And so he, in his spare time, created IPython, which is a project that still exists today and is part of the Jupyter ecosystem. And IPython is a command line tool for interactive Python. It is now considered what we call like a kernel for people to actually write code in many other languages. In fact, you can even create your own kernel. We just showed a blog post with kernels in C++. So if you want to do interactive C++, we have interactive C++. And from there, we got more people involved. We have a part of our team also Brian Granger, who also leads the project. And this eventually became IPython Notebooks, which is a tool in the browser for interactive Python visualization data science, which now became renamed to Jupyter because again, we are now we are actually a polyglot open source project. And so we now from there have a number of projects related to interactive computing, open source, open standards, and data science and scientific communication, which relate to education and lots of other applications. And so some of our latest projects, Binder and Jupyter Hub, come out of that sort of origin story. Yeah. I, the only other thing I'd add to that is that as the technology has grown in its complexity and the variety of uses, also the organization, Jupiter itself, has grown quite a bit. So it, as, as Jessica mentioned, it originated with you know a couple of developers on sort of you know extra side, side project kind of time, but now is a much more complex and diversified group of people, some of which are researchers at universities, some of which are data scientists or developers at companies companies, and many of which are just general open source enthusiasts who spend their time working on these projects. So there are some core members of the project, but it has a much broader open source community that represents both data analytics worlds like Python or R or something like this, but also a much broader spectrum of, of languages like C++ or JavaScript or, or anything else you could imagine. Jessica, you mentioned a couple of times the term interactive notebook as part of the Jupyter project. What exactly does that mean? So an interactive notebook is a browser interface in which a person can enter code. In this example, we'll take Python. And so let's say you are a data scientist writing Python and you have your pandas data frame and you want to be able to visualize it. Now, if you wanted to be able to get the visualization out of it, you probably would have to do a little bit of extra legwork to get the image out, to save it, to open it up and see it. Whereas in, in an interactive notebook, things flow together relatively seamlessly so that if you want to create the plot, the plot shows up in the browser. And so we really try to leverage the power of the browser to make scientific communication a part of scientific computing. Is this something that I would use standalone just myself, or is this something I would do in partnership with, say, another developer, kind of Google Doc style, or how does that flow work? You could do it either way. And in fact, people do do it either way. Communication in a 
I write something and then I send it to you or share it to you is very, very popular. People also use notebooks to write scratch. Say you're you're trying to prototype an idea and you want to be able to figure out if it runs or if you like the way um, the output looks to you, uh, you can do it that way. But additionally, we are actually are very interested in ideas of real-time collaboration as well today. That's something that we're working on and thinking about in the Jupiter Lab project. Additionally, you can communicate to people within a certain ecosystem, for example, within Jupiter Hub. Um, so, so these kinds of relationships between like communicating for yourself and communicating with other people are very important to us. So also people use it just with GitHub. So if GitHub has millions of notebooks, so people use it just like code, um, and GitHub even renders them automatically now. So that's another way to use it. I, th I think one of the interesting uh, origin stories of the Jupyter Notebook actually comes from scientific publishing. So one of the original ideas that, that the then IPython, now Jupyter team had was trying to find a way to package the sort of static representation of your work, which in, in science and academia is just basically a PDF. It's a snapshot of words that you write and static images that you generate. But behind those static images is a lot of really interesting complexity. And in some sense, that's the real work. Like the code and the operationalization of that code is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. And so one of the goals of the original notebook format was to create an interface and a way of packaging your work so that you didn't have to separate out the code from the narrative. And that hopefully would create different ways that you might try to communicate your results to other people in ways that are only possible when you can actively be interacting with whatever work it is that you're presenting to someone. And we've been really lucky in that we've had very good uptake from the scientific community, um, from the academic community. I think there are in the millions of Jupyter notebooks available on GitHub. In fact, it's now considered a language on GitHub, although I don't know necessarily if, if we think of it as a language per se, because a Jupyter Notebook can be written in any kind of language that we support, um, and we support tens of languages, like I've been in the over 100 at least. And so we have notebooks from the chief economist of the World Bank uh, that are on GitHub. We have notebooks from the LIGO project, uh, which recently won the physics Nobel Prize that are available on GitHub um, that we also host on Binder. So, so there are a lot of different interesting stuff that's being happening. I know media companies now are sharing their data journalism through Jupyter Notebooks. And so we're, we're really excited about the ways people have been able to use it today. Now, you've mentioned Jupyter Hub. Can you explain to us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, sure. So a Jupyter Notebook, for example, assumes that you're running something locally on your own computer. That's the most common pattern of interaction when you're writing code and, and running it against some kernel. What Jupyter Hub does is it allows you to host either on hardware that you own or somewhere in the cloud a server that manages multiple Jupyter processes at the same time. So it, it will use a Jupyter server to have many users simultaneously sending code to kernels and getting the responses back from them. It's useful partially because as a deployer of a Jupyter Hub, you can specify the environment that you want everyone to have access to. You can specify the packages, the versions, you can specify data that needs to be in a particular place uh, so that everyone has access to it. And the goal there is that by standardizing these things, you're creating a more consistent environment so that people can share their work more easily and you don't run into strange conflicts that come from you know, having the wrong package installed or having the incorrect version of data on some path on your computer. And the other hope is that you can use this, I should say, as a portal to shared computing infrastructure so that people who don't have, say, fancy, sophisticated hardware themselves or maybe who don't even have a laptop with you know, a ton of RAM can still do fairly complicated processing, but they're doing so via the cloud or via whatever resources the Jupyter Hub is deployed on. And so I think the goal there is that it, it, it increases the accessibility towards doing modern day data analytic interactive workflows in a way that's only possible when you have those kind of shared resources. And when we were talking earlier, you were saying how Jupyter Hub was sort of the impetus for why you started to engage with using Kubernetes. So um, the when I started working at Berkeley, uh, we had like a biggish course. We had like, what, 900 students at that time. We, they were learning fundamentals of data science and we wanted them to use a Jupyter Hub because we didn't want to spend our time 
like teaching people how to install stuff and like they might have different kinds of computers and then you know like someone's going to come up with windows xp and we have to like figure out how to install <laughs> python 3 there so we want to like eliminate that and then like allow students to focus directly on like learning data science this is also especially important because we were targeting groups that are not just in computer science but people from like other disciplines and whatnot and it was like we were running into some scaling problems at that time and we also wanted to be as cloud agnostic as possible we did not want to get locked into any specific cloud cloud vendor, and we also want to be able to run on bare metal if we needed to. And so at this point, Kubernetes was like a very good choice for us to make because it let us do all of this in one system. So we didn't need to have like, you know, like Ansible or something else that like set up the base system and then have like a clustering technology on top, uh, which was like a lot more complex to manage. This was just like, okay, we have a Kubernetes cluster. We can do everything we want on top of it. And the scalability is fairly elastic. You can go up and down without too many problems. So we were like, okay, let's just like, I, I've al I was already writing the Kubernetes integration for Jupyter Hub for a while as a volunteer, and then I just got hired at Berkeley to do that full time. So does that mean that you have to have a Kubernetes cluster to run Jupyter Hub, or is it an optional? Not thing? necessarily. So Jupyter Hub is uh, very extensible. You can plug in any authenticator you want, and the same way you can plug in any spawner you want. So it ships with the default spawner that just doesn't assume anything except you have a Linux machine. But then there are spawners for like lots of popular technology. The spawners just that just use a Docker container. There's the Kubernetes spawner that we have written, and then there's just like there's a systemd spawner. There's like lots of spawners people. Them. I think one of the challenges that the Data 8 faced in particular is that when you're designing technology for something like science or education, you have to make assumptions that the organizations that are going to be using that technology don't have oftentimes as much resources and funds to hire people as you would if you were at a company or something like this. And I think one of the benefits of Kubernetes is that because of the properties that people often talk about in terms of you know self-healing and scalability and stuff like this, you can often manage more complex deployments with fewer highly trained technical you know DevOps style people. And you know data eight, as you mentioned now, it's it's over I think fourteen hundred students or something like this, and it has by some accounts a, a relatively modest team of people who are actively developing it and and upgrading it and maintaining it over time. And my intuition is that that's something that would be much more difficult to do if you were using other kinds of you know cloud deployment uh, approaches. So I know when we first were talking about doing this podcast, Jessica, you were telling me about Binder, and I know Binder's built off of Jupyter Hub. So can you tell us a little more about Binder and what it does and and why it was built? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll start with the story of Binder. So Binder originally started as a project that was out of Genelia Farm, and it was a project to share notebooks in a curated manner um, so that you had notebooks that had a similar idea or a similar narrative story to come together in, in one cohesive piece. And so the current setup we have now is the version 2.0 of Binder, um, which is a uh, publicly available service for GitHub repos to share with the public in a way that it has the entire environment set up so that you go to a specific URL and you are launched in a Docker container, and that ends up giving you the opportunity to work with the repo with everything already pre-installed. So it's a similar experience to the things that the Data8 students are getting, um, but in this case, you are getting specifically the repo that you are looking at from GitHub. Um, and this is particularly interesting for applications in science and education, also um, people who are uh, creating new libraries and want to show it off. In fact, that's what we use to show off Jupyter Lab. We ended up using Binder and said, if you want to try out JupyterLab, here, we have it right now. You just click on the URL and you are taken to the user interface of JupyterLab. You don't need to install anything. Here it is. Play with it. See how you like it. So that's particularly interesting for us because it's a different way for us to interact with the public, providing open source as a service for us to share scientific data science repositories through GitHub. And in fact, Binder is actually a number of projects that are connected together. There are modular pieces. Jupyter Hub is actually one of them. And the other major pieces under it are repo to Docker, the Binder server itself. And then we also have front ends such as Jupyter Notebooks, RStudio, and Jupyter Lab. It's worth highlighting that Binder was originally created by the group of a researcher named Jeremy Freeman. And it was also open source technology. It was running online in the cloud. And it performed what Jessica just described, you know, being able to share an interactive data analytic environment uh, with you know, a single link. And 
because that project was open source, the Jupyter team started having conversations with the, the, the first incarnation of the Binder project, basically realizing that a lot of the complexity of, of the tooling in Binder 1.0, call it, was doing a lot of the stuff that Jupyter Hub handles very flexibly and very nicely already. And so there was kind of a realization that, well, what if we could just make Binder a particular configuration of a deployment of a Jupyter Hub and add one extra component, which is the ability to automatically generate your computing environment on the fly so that people can specify their environment just via random text files in their GitHub repository rather than requiring people to you know craft a Docker image on their own. So those projects kind of fused together into in a collaboration that's been going on for about a year or so now. But a lot of that initial heavy lifting, I, we're all very thankful to the original Binder team for. And I know when we were talking about Binder, the reason behind driving out, building out Binder 2, or part of the reason, was, you know, you've got so much great content and research that's being done in the scientific community, and there was a desire to be able to make it easier for people to run that kind of content and run that without having to recreate it from scratch. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the points of friction in scientific research is being able to reproduce or being able to work with the scientific computation pipeline that is in a particular paper. So, for example, the LIGO project is probably our most famous research institute who has their research available on Binder. They have a demo that allows people to get immediate access to their data, which is gravitational wave data, and show people basic signal processing methods so that you can reproduce their study and basically find the gravitational waves that they got the Nobel Prize for. Um, if people did not necessarily have access to Binder, it would be less interactive. One would have to figure out how the dependencies were set up, install everything from scratch, and try to piece together all the different parts of the repo to understand how to reproduce this result. Whereas with Binder, and also Jupyter Notebooks, it becomes a seamless interactive notebook that has everything pre-installed. And so you can walk yourself through the thinking of these scientists and understand how they conduct their own research. Yeah, the, the way that I like to think about this is um, there's, in my mind, a difference between making your work technically open and reproducible versus making it practically open and reproducible. And a lot of times you'll see people just throw a bunch of code and maybe some description of the environment needed to run that code onto the web somewhere. And while it is technically possible that you could go through all of the different steps of trying to figure out what it is was going through the author's head when they put all of this there, the vast majority of, of people aren't going to take the time to you know, clone a repository, pull it onto their computer, install all the packages that are needed, get the data into the right place, you know, spin up their own session, start stepping through it, debug problems when they come up. Most people just won't do that. But if you could do something like share the ability to interact with that repository just via a single link that someone clicks and they can immediately start getting up and running, I think that the barrier to entry there is low enough that people will actually start doing it. And then you can do different kinds of things uh, in terms of designing your content when you're assuming that others are going to be interacting with it. And uh, we, we recently presented some work at the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency Conference in New York with regards to accountability and transparency in machine learning research, although we believe this extends to all different kinds of scientific research and data science in general. But the, the interesting distinction, I think, in when we think about what Binder does is that historically when people were thinking about reproducibility, they wanted to be able to to independently validate what happened in a scientific study, doing it in their own laboratory or their own environment. We're basically trying to uh, replicate the environment of the scientist as much as possible with modern computational methods. So it is as if the laboratory is opening the doors to the public and allowing people to walk in and says, these are our tools, this is what we did, and you can, you can use these tools as if they were your own. So it's kind of a, an interesting distinction and I think that's part of the reason why we think about it even as an accountability and transparency project, because this the distinction is actually that you're not necessarily reproducing it in that it's not a separate thing. It is the exact same environment as the scientist that is producing this research. Awesome. This sounds really great. So if I'm sitting down and I'm doing some research and I have this data set that I'm doing research on and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I want to get this out on Binder, where do I put my data? What does that development pipeline look like? How do I get that sort of thing set up? 
So one of the goals of Binder is to try and piggyback on pre-existing tools in the open source ecosystem as much as possible. And what that means is that the delta, the amount of energy that's needed to make a, a repository, quote unquote, Binder ready, is pretty small. What Binder does is when you give it a URL to a Git repository, and that could be something on GitHub or GitLab or, or wherever you put your code, as long as it's publicly available, it's going to check out the repository and it looks for what are called configuration files. And by that, what I mean is if you're a Python developer, requirement.txt or environment.yaml. If you're a Julia developer, a capital require file. It also looks for things like apt.txt files to specify apt uh, packages. And the goal of this is to infer the environment that's needed from text files that are already part of the workflows for people from those various communities. And so from the author's perspective, if you want to make your repository interactive via something like Binder, all you need to do is make sure that those text files are there in either the root of your repository or in a folder in the root of your repo called Binder. Binder is then just going to automatically look through those files, and whenever it finds them, it generates a Docker file that says, okay, I need you know this version of NumPy installed and this version of Matplotlib installed. It then generates a Docker image from that Docker file and registers it online. And then Binder knows how to ask for certain images based on the links that different users are, are clicking on. So in many cases, you don't actually have to do anything. If you've already sort of followed best practices in scientific computing, you've already included you know, an environment.yaml file with your repository. In many cases, all you need to do is just give that URL to Binder, and it'll do the rest. And where do I put my data? Like, especially if I have very large sets of data, where does that go? Does it go in my GitHub repository? Um, I think that if you ask 10 different people, you would get 10 different responses <laughs> to that. <laughs> The examples that we've seen so far generally use smaller sets of data just okay. because the amount of computational power we have is rather limited. So the work that we've done so far on showing how people can use Binder have been on projects where the size of the data is relatively limited and the amount of computation that a person is finally using at the tail end is limited. So we won't necessarily be able to reproduce on Binder a study that used an entire server farm, for example. But if you do have these pieces and parts, the computation then, since it is interactive, can be modified. So for example, in the, the write-up we had for the Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency study, we took a uh, Ichkai paper that had relatively simple experiments computationally. They weren't expensive. And we said, OK, let's try modifying this experiment and seeing how this works, um, which is actually very interesting interesting because in a lot of studies, you are given, this is what we did, it's done, there it is. But the way Binder works, because it uses interactive computing and it has the same environment, it says, now that you have this tool, this model, this idea, it, we give you the ability to interact with the research in a way that people haven't been able to do online in a publication like experience, which is particularly interesting, I think, because um, it allows people to be able to think beyond what the researchers are simply telling you and work with the repo in a way that you might want to be able to work with it on your own, that you didn't necessarily ha weren't able to do it because it required so much legwork to get to that point. But is it built to be able to work with server farms? I mean, is it built to be able to hook into that kind of uh, thing? Yeah. Um, it ultimately uses Jupyter Hub to do to actually run your code, and Jupyter Hub can like hook into anything you want. Like, so right now, because we run it as a free public service, we put limits on like how much RAM you can use and all of that. But you can set up one for your own institution or whatever, and then give it as much resources as you want, running on whatever kind of infrastructure you need. Uh, so you could, for example, just configure your Jupyter Hub to use. Uh, I think there is a Google Cloud VM spawner, so then everyone basically gets one entire machine. Or you can just configure it to like, okay, everyone gets like an instance group that can scale up and down as they want. Yes. And then to, to your question mark, you can integrate with any kind of data repositories that exist out there. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of like what you do in your code. I know, for example, that is the Pangeo project. They're an NSF-funded project that tries to make a central platform for people to do earth sciences. And so they store all their data in like GCS, Google Cloud Storage. And so they have like Fuse uh, drivers that let them get data directly from GCS. And the UK Met Office has something similar, but they are an S3, so they get the data out of S3. And this is all like agnostic to JupyterHub. We don't actually care how you do this. 
actually also um, one of the earliest users of Jupiter Hub for scientific computing and research is actually the, the labs in the Department of Energy. They end up doing a lot of high performance computing and they have a lot of scientists who aren't DevSops people, who aren't necessarily the most sophisticated when it comes to running complex jobs. And they want to be able to have as lightweight of an experience as possible. And Jupiter Hub was a really great way for them to have access to really powerful Jupiter notebooks. Is this only meant for scientific communities, or have you seen use cases outside? So uh, I don't think it's only meant for scientific computing. Like, so I came into this from Wikimedia, and so where it's like a very like oh free knowledge, everyone should be able to participate. And so I was at the time helping run like uh, this thing called Tool Labs, which is we provide free compute for people who want to do things with Wikimedia data. So for example, a lot of the anti-vandalism bots run here, a lot of the statistics stuff run here. But we required people to SSH in and then use like Grid Engine, and there was complex. It was like excluding a lot of people. So from our perspective at the time, we were like we wanted more people people to be able to access our data and do things with it. And so a good solution was JupyterHub. So that's where I actually started working on the Kubernetes stuff because we had a Kubernetes cluster and we were like, okay, let's put JupyterHub on this so we can securely provide access to our data to people. So we provide access to our dumps, but even to our like direct uh, MySQL database, which was live. We like redacted all the sensitive information and gave people access to that. And that's something you cannot do on your own computer. Right? Like, because that's a data store that's only available there. It's really large. It's like updated in real time. And there's, I think, like 4 million edits or something that people have made from that Jupyter Hub. So that's, I think, a very good use case. And I think there's more people doing things like that. I think, I think it's worth highlighting again, because I think this is actually related to your previous point, too. The goal of the Jupyter ecosystem is to build open source building blocks that can be composed and used for, for whatever use case you might have in mind. And so sometimes that is doing scientific research. Sometimes that is teaching a class either at the university university level or even at the you know elementary school and middle school levels sometimes it means providing an interactive environment to connect with some resources or hardware that would otherwise be very difficult to connect to, like what you've just described with the Wikipedia data set. And related then to your question about storage, our goal, the Jupyter Project's goal, is not to create completely tightly integrated, you know, full stack solutions. Our goal is to build pieces that can be put together in order to accomplish some goal. And so what I would say when when people ask, you know, how is Jupyter Hub going to handle large scale storage? Part of my answer is, well, we don't really have to. We just need to make sure that when there's another open tool that exists that makes that possible, that it's easy to integrate that into the sort of Jupyter Hub binder workflow. Do you have any features, functionality that are up and coming that are in the future of Jupyter Hub, Binder, Project Jupyter in general? We have lots. Anything that you want to talk about? <laughs> lots is good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one thing that we've been working on is high scale. So we are trying to get up to 50,000 active users at a time, spanning multiple Kubernetes clusters and multiple hubs, but all present into the user as one. So that's like one, one area we have like put a lot of work into it at the moment. Uh, we are also like on the binder side, I think something that we did like fairly recently and it's not super public is we added RStudio support because I think a lot of people in the R community, they prefer using RStudio rather than Jupyter Notebooks. And so we wanted to be able to like, you know, we don't want to force people to switch tools just because they want to use us. So we were like, okay, let's make this generic enough so that people can use RStudio or whatever else it is that they want to use. I, I think that another interesting like future direction for development, UV just described uh, what would often be described as scaling outward. So we're just trying to get more and more and more users for a given Jupyter Hub deployment. But especially in more sophisticated data science teams or in academic research, scientific research, you do need access to non-trivial sized data sets or you need access to high performance clusters and things like this. And so I think that there's going to be a push of development towards connecting Jupyter Hub or something like Binder with more sophisticated hardware or more sophisticated you know, cloud infrastructure for, for doing computations and analyzing data on that hardware. And I'm excited to see the different kinds of, of uses that people come up with it as the ecosystem of tools that are kind of natively running in the cloud continues to develop further. I also want to say one of our biggest new features is more documentation. I think it's like nice. a lot better documented now than it was like six months to a year ago. Jessica, Chris, and Carol Willing, who's not here, have been doing a great job of like making sure that like you know like the only information is not in some chat somewhere or like hidden up in someone's brain, but written out in ways that like a diverse group of people can actually understand and reuse in their own contexts. I know. What has it been like working on an open source project for all of you? And it sounds like multiple 
in some cases. I've been working on open source projects. I I was working at GNOME when I was like 19 and I was working at like Wikimedia. So I ne- I don't know what it is like to not work at an open source project. <laughs> so I'm kind of an outlier, but like uh, Jupyter is the first project that I'm on that's like partially based in academia. So that's a little like different. And it's also like a much more smaller project. Like when I joined, when I started working at Wikimedia, it was already like very big. But how is it different? I think in a smaller project, you have more responsibilities to be kinder to everyone than you have at a larger project. Now, I'm not saying that it's okay to be like mean to people at a larger project, but I think if you are person 40 in a project or person 16 in a project, then you have more responsibilities than if you're person 800 at a project. If you're person 800, the culture is already sort of set. Changing that is going to be an uphill battle and it's going to be hard. While if you're at a smaller person project, then you it's much easier to set. So if you're not careful, then you can set it in ways that you don't want it to be. So I think that's like the biggest difference. There's technical differences, of course. When I was at Wikimedia, I was like the 16th person to join the ops team, and I was the least experienced person doing that. While here, I think like most people don't have that much ops knowledge because they come through like as like grad students and whatnot. So that was also like a big difference. Uh, for me. But I think related to that, from from my perspective, one of the most exciting things about the Jupyter project, and probably open source in general, is that because of the open nature of the project, you get a lot more voices in the room and you get a lot of representation from different kinds of background in the room. So I think it's amazing that I get to work on you know, a team of people, some of which are heavily ops-oriented and have an incredible background in you know, Kubernetes, some of which care about things like documentation and community growth and, and the more social aspects of open source, some of whom are more you know, domain scientists who run analytics and Python or in R. Are, but wouldn't be able to deploy you know, a Kubernetes cluster by themselves, being able to coordinate that kind of chaotic, diverse group of people in a way that you can create tools that are truly community-driven and also available for all kinds of use cases is a really satisfying thing. And in some ways is, in my mind, the primary goal of the academic and education and scientific community is creating public goods that people can then build on for whatever purpose they have in mind. How do you coordinate or how does that get coordinated? I think that each sub project has their own subculture and their own sub methods. And so that largely determines how it works. So actually, like, for example, for me, I belong to, I think, like five different Jupyter project organizations. A lot of people don't even know that we have multiple repos. I think we have over a hundred. We have at least five or six organizations. Um, So each organization has their own norms and culture, but we we actually share the same code of conduct. So at the, the higher level, you know, like values, norms, things like that are shared. And we have a governance repo. If you want to spy on how we work, it's all available to the public. In fact, all our meetings are available to the public. We put them online on YouTube. So our, our big weekly meetings are every Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can watch us online. Uh, but each individual project then has their own subnorm. So, for example, there's a monthly meeting that we have with the Jupyter Hub and Binder group. Jupyter Lab meets every week, and we we talk, we have a, a one hour meeting once a week. But each uh, you know some some groups just mostly work through uh, the mailing list and the issues. And so it's it's all like a, a combination of all these things. I guess one of the things that we probably I haven't mentioned enough that we probably should say more is, again, we are an open source project. And so anybody can basically jump in at any time. And so we, we really try to do that. And I think that's also a lot of what I do is I basically try to Tom Sawyer people into saying, do you like Jupiter? You can work for us too. And and basically I get them to do my work for me. But really it actually, it's, it's something that's very, very important to us. In fact, we're having a community day, I think the 25th of August in New York, um, which is a free day for anyone who wants to show up. Or if you just want to show up on the internet, we will be actively working uh, on issues that's community related. And we follow GitHub's norms of marking issues as first issue or help wanted. So those things are particularly standard. But again, like the broader, the like sort of other kinds of implementations are slightly different from team to team. And then were there any resources that you wanted to mention in regards to... In regards to... Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Notebook. We were talking about some of the classes that are out there. Yeah, where would people go if they want to learn about these projects? So I think that in terms of sort of examples of particular deployments of Jupyter Hubs for particular use cases, if you go to data8.org, 
just data than the number eight.org. That is a, a public facing version of Data 8, which is this major course at, at UC Berkeley that UV has been working on and that has driven a lot of the technical infrastructure, particularly on the Kubernetes side of Jupyter Hub. There's also mybinder.org is the public service version of Binder. So as Jessica mentioned, Binder Hub is open source technology that anybody could use for whatever purpose they want to, to, to deploy a Binder server. MyBinder.org is a kind of technical demonstration and a, and a free public service where as a user, you can begin to interact with that and create shareable public links for your code repositories. And then from a developer standpoint or from like a deployer standpoint, the best way to learn how to deploy Jupyter Hub on Kubernetes is that there's a guide called Zero to Jupyter Hub, which you can find at z2jh.jupyter.org. And on the flip side, for Binder Hub, there is uh, a guide to deploying Binder Hub on Kubernetes at binderhub.readthedocs.io. Also, I should probably mention um, another project on the stack. Um, we have repo to Docker, um, and that is also under the GitHub organization, Jupyter Hub. A lot of the projects we've been talking about have been under the GitHub organization, Jupyter Hub. So if you go to github.com slash Jupyter Hub, you'll see a number of our projects, and repo to Docker is one of them, which is also particularly useful if you want to take a GitHub repo and turn it into a Docker file or something that can be easily used and shared in that kind of format. This is great. Well, I, I really appreciate all of you coming and, and talking to us about Project Jupyter, Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Hub, and, and Binder. Anything else that you wanted to talk about before we go? I just want to say, if you know Kubernetes or want to learn more about it, then you should come and talk to us because there's a lot of things that we are doing on top of it. Um, and having more people do that would be great. And you will have lots of impact. And lots of people will use your stuff. I, actually, one other thing, a follow-up to your previous question. If you just want to get involved in the community of the Jupyter community more broadly, we have a Gitter channel for pretty much all of the major projects. So there's a Binder Gitter channel and a Jupyter Hub Gitter channel. There's also a Gitter channel for most of the other components that we've talked about in this interview. And we're also pretty closely monitoring issues and mailing lists and also a lot of just community groups that, that are scattered across cities all over the world. So we try to be as welcoming and inviting a community as humanly possible. And we would love for whoever is listening to this to, to get involved. Well, great. Well, thank you again. I'm so glad you all were able to come to join us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you, Jessica, UV, and Chris. We really appreciate you coming onto the podcast and telling us all about Project Jupiter, telling us about Jupiter Hub and Binder and all that. And also just hearing about how Kubernetes is being used in the project as well. That was fun. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, super interesting project. Really great to see that kind of collaborative development platform getting built and having people use it. It's pretty and awesome. All open source. Mm. Open source is the best. Okay, so. Question of the week. I'm going to ask you. Yay. Yay. All right. Uh, <laughs> how did Google's predictions do during March Madness? So, actually, let's set some context. I know March Madness, big basketball. There we go. Yes. Basketball tournament. Google Cloud is a sponsor, and there is a bunch of machine learning stuff that was put in place to see if we could predict who is going to win and who is going to lose. That's is that right. right. And there was also a Calgo competition that's been going on to uh, allow others to run their own prediction models and see how effective they were in March madness. Uh, but Google did do its own separate prediction model and worked hard at trying to be able to come up with real-time predictions, too, because during March Madness, apparently, during like the halftime, uh, they would take the data from the first half and feed it into the model and come back with predictions prior to the second half. Oh, cool. During the Final Four, there was a couple of halftime ads that were even generated within like the halftime show to then show what they thought the predictions were. And apparently... They had a prediction where Loyola versus Michigan were playing, and they predicted 29 rebounds, and they were right. And then they also predicted during Villanova and Michigan that at least 21 three-pointer attempts would be made, and the final count was 24. So anyways, it was really interesting. And, nice. and there's a blog post that helps give some insights in terms of how the prediction model was built. And this is actually something you would do with typically any kind of data science project in terms of figuring out what type of data you need, then building out the pipeline that you're going to need to feed the data and, and build out the model and train it, and then deploying it into production. And so they had this model they trained off of 
200,000 discrete files from a decade of NCAA basketball data. Nice. They apparently engineered over 800 potential features and then applied variants and univariate statistical tests, and they built out their models using these more standard regression and classification techniques. And when the games were actually playing, they were updating um, their entire game state every two seconds, and including all play-by-play data. And they were using Cloud Spanner to help with this kind of processing that they needed to do, as well as BigQuery. So like I said, there's a blog post. We're going to include that blog post so that you can see how specifically they actually engineered their prediction models, how it was deployed. And it'll give you some great insights to think about when you're doing your own type of data analysis, data prediction modeling. And yeah, it's kind of cool. It's kind of cool what the results look like. It's kind of cool how they built it. And congrats to the team. Nice. Awesome. All right, Melanie, uh, before we wrap up today, are you going anywhere, doing anything cool? Yes, I will be speaking at Tectonica actually this week on the 11th, and I'm going to be talking about AI. And then uh, actually this weekend on Saturday, I'm going to be speaking at the Harker Research Symposium on the 14th, participating in a panel to talk about diversity and inclusion. Nice. Mark, what about you? So I'm not going anywhere, but I did just start something really oh, cool. Oh, that's sad. Uh, it's fine. I... Um, I was very focused on the Econet's launch and Game Developers Conference, which means I need to wrap back up. But in the meantime, I've started doing something really cool that I'm really excited about. Okay. I've started streaming the work that I'm doing on the Econet's development nice. uh, thing. So if you're into game development and you're interested in like patterns and strategies for scaling multiplayer games, it could be interesting. But if you're into Kubernetes and you want to look at like custom resource definitions or controllers, or on Friday last week I was doing some Helm integration, that kind of stuff, you might find it interesting as well. So We'll put the link in the show notes, twitch.tv slash Mark Mandel. I'm doing Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific on a regular basis, but also trying to do a lot of little ad hoc sessions as well. You're doing all kinds of shows now. Yeah, it's fun. It's so much. Actually, streaming coding is delightfully wonderful. Well, that's great. And as far as I know it, Mark, you and I are working on trying to make sure that we do an actual interview on Agonis. So hopefully that'll be coming up soon. Yeah. As soon as we can sort out some of the logistics. I should get on that. That would be fun. Because your schedule is pretty busy. Awesome. Well, Melanie, thank you so much for joining me for yet another podcast. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next week. 